Uh, my name is George Waring from the Medical University of South Carolina. My journey into ophthalmology has uh, been a little bit circuitous. Uh, like you mentioned, I have a, a degree, a dual degree, one degree in economics and another degree in environmental science. And what I realized was that um, I was drawn into medicine uh, for probably like most people are drawn into medicine uh, to um, have the opportunity to dedicate your life to uh, helping the human condition. Uh, and ophthalmology uh, sparked my interest mostly because of uh, technology and the ability to be uh, uh, involved in innovation. My current research focus has to do with the combined fields and subspecialty areas of re traditional refractive surgery and uh, cataract surgery into a, an emerging specialty of refractive cataract surgery. Uh, particular, uh, the ubiquitous condition of presbyopia is also a focus of ours and trying to push the limits of visual potential by understanding advanced diagnostics and quality of vision. If a 45-year-old patient walks in with complaints of presbyopia, uh, we're going to be thinking about a corneal-based solution because this is really a stage one dysfunctional lens syndrome, i.e. the earliest part of an aging dysfunctionality of their internal lens is their loss of, of their ability to, to focus. So here's a patient with in, incipient or early manifest presbyopia. So this is gonna be a corneal-based solution and currently we're thinking about corneal inlays, presbyopic inlays, and or utilizing any potential pre-existing myopia that they may have as well. Um, but in a patient who's this young, probably they are not myopic or else they wouldn't be complaining. So we may be actually combining this with an eczema procedure to induce a little myopia and preserve their depth of focus with a corneal inlay. Yeah, so it depends on the degree of myopia. Often we'll try to utilize some of their current conditions to the patient's advantage, whether that be defocus, uh, particularly in terms of myopia, or even with higher aberrations, often we'll use that for some depth of focus. So we'll try to use what they have and use it to their advantage. So we may fix in their dominant eye, we would actually fix their myopia. And in their non-dominant eye, we would leave just enough for that to be useful for them. And then in addition to that, we may also combine that with a presbyopic inlay as well, which then would give them a full range of vision. Again, Thinking about choosing and matching the best lens to the patient also falls into the rubric of decision-making and refractive surgery, in particular, refractive cataract surgery. And we really feel that this is an emerging specialty unto its own because the optics of this can be relatively complex. Believe it or not, the worldwide market is really only 2% for presbyopia correcting IOLs. I mean, if you think about that, only 2% of doctors are comfortable in planning these lenses. And there's a reason for that, because they may not fully feel comfortable in terms of the decision making for who's a candidate and who's not. Clearly, more than 2% of the world is uh, 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 in terms of IOL, the IOL, current IOL market uh, is uh, uh, a candidate for this technology. However, um, even if it was double that, uh, then we'd, we'd be thinking about this a little bit differently. So first and foremost, we got to think about the topography and the patient having a, a, a healthy eye. Assuming that we can correct their uh, astigmatism and that this is not a highly aberrated eye 
and they have a healthy cornea otherwise and a healthy retina otherwise, then that really opens up the possibilities. We're uh, currently in the United States, the low ad multifocals uh, are performing extremely well. And so what our current strategy is, is to use a plus 2.75 technus multifocal in the dominant eye. And soon after we would then see how the patient's doing. If they want a little bit more reading, we may give some additional ad, for example, a plus 3.25 ad in their non-dominant eye or just match with the plus 2.75. Uh, down the road, we'll have access to more advanced technologies such as uh, this new concept of extended depth of focus lenses such as the Symphony, which you all have available in Europe and is performing extremely well. This is going to allow us to break in out of that 2% of the market and more doctors are going to feel comfortable using this technology because it'll be more forgiving. Yeah, uh, patient selection uh, in terms of psychological profiling is an important consideration in the, in the global picture of patient selection with advanced IOLs. But what we found is that it's actually an extremely small percentage of the population that may be excluded due to, for example, uh, uh, um, obsessive compulsive traits. What we found to be more important is that we have to carefully educate our patients and set expectations. So the adage of under-promising and over-delivering can't be overemphasized. And this allows us to address a patient that might classically be thought of as a non-candidate due to behavioral traits and where you can actually access these patients and help them. And at the end of the day, these patients may want this technology and deserve this technology just like anybody else. Um, but you have to deliver. You have to be able to fix the, if you're off focus, you have to have the ability to be able to put them in focus, typically with an eczema laser. And you have to be, uh, um, again, really focused on making sure they understand the trade-offs, the inherent trade-offs, because nothing's perfect. There's been a tremendous amount of work done in advanced diagnostics in, in recent years. And we think that this is critical in the, this whole treatment paradigm and this whole paradigm of refractive cataract surgery because it not only allows us to best uh, uh, serve our patients and make the best choices, it also helps us to better educate our patients too and help them understand why we may offer a laser solution on their internal lens versus their external lens, i.e. their cornea. So we perform an all-digital lens-centric exam, we call the advanced ocular analysis in our center, and this allows us to take patients on a digital tour of their eye instead of an animated representation, we can actually show them the dysfunctionalities of their aging changes. And it helps them understand why we're making the decisions. It helps them understand their condition. And it also helps us make the best decision in terms of really understanding where, where their dysfunctionalities lie uh, in, within, their, within their eye. So in terms of the technologies we're most excited about, uh, I'd say within uh, the current horizon, this is, uh, includes things related to functional vision. And this is a, a large research interest of ours in terms of being able to objectively capture visual quality and, and, and light as it falls on the retina. Herman Snellen described Snellen visual acuity in 1863. And this is still our gold standard, which is simply unacceptable. We need to push the boundaries, and we understand that not all 2020 is created equal. And the goal should be objective image quality. And now we have the capability to do this uh, with things like double pass wavefront, ray tracing technologies, and uh, densitometry, things where we can truly objectively show image quality and light scatter and uh, things of this nature. So this is very exciting. In terms of future horizons, 
I think visual simulators uh, such as uh, adaptive optics technology hold great promise. Being able to have a patient actually describe what they want, you can simulate it and they can fine tune it real time and then perhaps even export this into the laser of your choice to achieve that result. Regarding EpiOn versus EpiOff, uh, I would we have to um, salute uh, the, the the Swiss camp and and understand that basically that we're discussing crosslinking because of uh, those from Dresden and, and others and what they've contributed to our field, which is just a tremendous tremendous one of the most important contributions in ophthalmology to date. And so we're greatly indebted to them. And I would agree with their assertion that EpiOff is currently superior to EpiOn in terms of efficacy. I don't think anybody would disagree that in terms of safety, EpiOn would be superior. And so in terms, I'd like to think in terms of horizons, in terms of our current landscape and with our current technologies, I do believe EpiOff is superior in our biomechanics lab. We've actually demonstrated uh, from a biomechanical efficacy standpoint that EpiOff is superior. But with future technologies that are not far away, such as ionophoresis and other bioenhancers, and what we're really understanding now is the role of oxygen. It's probably not that the epithelium is keeping out the riboflavin so much as oxygen, which is what allows the reaction to take place. We're going to have new technologies where we can manipulate this and enhance it in a way that EpiOn will be as efficacious, or at least we'll have a better balance with safety and efficacy. In terms of corneal cross-linking and refractive surgery and what's come to be known as PIXEL, uh, I think this is an incredibly exciting uh, foray and potential application of cross-linking. I'm not sure that we'll ever have the, effi the, the uh, efficacy of, say, an eczema laser. Um, however, I think it's an incredibly important piece of the puzzle in terms of potentially combining the two. Uh, and in certain conditions, perhaps low myopia, things of this nature, certain patients, I do think it will be part of the treatment paradigm in the future, but I see it more as an adjunctive treatment uh, in its current state. But the, the technology is just getting so good so fast that I think that the, the future is bright and there's a lot of potential applications. <music>